Un saludo a toda la audiencia del espectador que nos acompaña en esta entrevista. Hoy estamos con Andrea Wolf, una reconocida escritora, historiadora, divulgadora científica. Andrea, thank you very much for joining us in this interview. Thank you for having me. Andrea, event eventually because of the invasion of nature and to understand Alexander von Humboldt's great journey in this territory, you had a relationship with Latin America. What is your relationship with this side of the planet now and with Colombia? Um, so I had never been to Latin America before I wrote The Invention of Nature. And um, the great thing when you write a book about an explorer is that you have to follow his footsteps. So I started with Venezuela and Ecuador and then Colombia, Mexico, Peru and um, Chile, although he never went to Chile, so I only just went to Chile. So for me, it was the, one of the greatest surprises doing this, doing this book because I completely and utterly fell in love with that Latin America. I still don't speak Spanish, which is really, really embarrassing, but I just love this place and um, I love Colombia. I mean, there, so I, I love nature. This is the reason why I wrote this book. And um, this is just so spectacular here. I mean, you have such amazing biodiversity here in Colombia. So the last 10, no, more than 10 years now, um, I have been here, except for the pandemic, um, all the time, whenever I can. Super. In recent weeks, you have been in several American Latin countries. Uh, do you usually take advantage of these trips to gather information for your work? Yes, so, but as I'm not writing about Humboldt anymore, I don't have to do research anymore. So now I can just enjoy it, which is really, really nice. Um, so I've just spent, so this is the reason why I've just been in, in Chile and I kind of went all over the place, just enjoying it. And I mean, I do, I do talks, I do talk about Humboldt, I give lectures on Humboldt, but um, I can, I now travel as a tourist mm. to Latin America, not so much research anymore. But the first few years was always research, always um, following his footsteps, trying to experience a little bit what he felt, because I don't know how other authors do this, but I need to see the landscapes that um, my protagonists see. And I had, for example, never been in the rainforest before. So that was incredibly important. And then suddenly you realize why Humboldt is constantly writing about mosquitoes because you know you are just attacked by mosquitoes the whole time and it was very important for me to climb in the andes to kind of get a sense of what he experienced okay and by the way what are you working now what are and <laughs> if you can give us a preview i'm working on another explorer Um, but he did not come to South America, okay. so it's uh, it's going to be the it's going to be the South Pacific now. In some of your lectures, uh, you have said that Alexander von Humboldt is the forgotten father of the environmentalism. Why? Well, he traveled to Latin America in 1799, and he spent four years here, and it was a journey that really shaped his life and his thinking, and that made him famous across the world. And it was here in Latin America that he realized that nature is an interconnected whole, kind of living organism, where everything's connected from the smallest insect to the tallest trees. But he also realized here that humankind is destroying nature. So as he was traveling through South America, he saw, for example, how plantation owners had completely destroyed the forests to make way for cash crops. And seeing that, he was the first to understand the fundamental functions of the forest for the mm. ecosystem. And he talked about the tree's ability to protect the soil, to enrich the atmosphere with moisture. So he, because he, he un, because he connects everything, he understood what was happening. He sees how ruthless pearl fishing kind of destroyed the oyster stock. So wherever he traveled through South America, he saw this and then he eventually began to write about it. And in his diary, for example, I found a diary entry where he says, in Mexico, he says, they are raping nature. So he's, he's very clear in his criticism. Mm -hmm. So he talks about harmful human-induced climate change in, 18, in 1800, so more than 200 years ago. So that's why he's the forgotten father of environmentalism. 
Uh, a couple months ago, a climate change summit ended and left some lessons, but several disappointments. And today you are in Colombia in a particular time. We have very high temperatures, we have fires, and possibly uh, there will be drought. Are there any of that kind of humble ideas that you think are worth rescuing to help us reflect on these complex times? Well, I think um, he doesn't have a solution because he couldn't know back then how bad it's going to be. But he's an inspiration, I think, because he's a scientist who who also, who on the one hand, measured everything in nature. So he's kind of, you know, he's an empirical scientist, but at the same time, he always said that he was driven by a sense of wonder. He said that we only can truly understand nature if we use our emotions and our imagination. And I think that is something that's really missing in today's climate change debates, that we are talking about numbers, statistics, figures, projections, which I think is incredibly important. I love the scientists, so it's not me talking against the scientists here at all. But I think we also need artists, filmmakers, mm -hmm. poets, writers, who will tell this story slightly differently to engage more people in that something has to change. Because we will only we, you know, we only protect what we love. So we need poets, filmmakers, artists to kind of bring back this love for nature, to tell a slightly different story, to communicate the threat in another way. And I think for me, that is really where I draw a lot of in inspiration from Humboldt from, because he is the bridge between the arts and the sciences, between poetry and the sciences. Okay. Let's talk about a bit uh, about the Jena group, uh, the Magnificent Rebels. I'm struck by how much influence some of the women, such as uh, Caroline Schlegel, had on that group and how much they contributed to the idea of Romanticism. Had they been somewhat overshadowed by history? And how difficult was it to reconstruct their lives compared to other much more uh, recognized characters? So these people are very famous in Germany. So, and because they're, so these are the young romantics who came together in the last decade of the 18th century, this tiny little town in Germany called Jena, which is about 250 kilometers southwest of Berlin. And some of the names there in Germany are like the literary superstars. So mm -hmm. they kept all their letters, they were, incredible letter writers. So there are thousands and thousands and thousands of their letters. It was a university town. There were lots of students mm. who wrote letters home describing their professors and these famous people. So it was that was not so difficult to Thank find you. the sources. What was difficult is kind of to put them all together and to bring mm. them alive. Because for me, they are... So Humboldt is also part of this group. That's how I started um, writing about this. But they, they talked a lot about bringing the arts and the sciences together. They really tried to kind of work against the increasingly materialistic world. Mm. They, um, but they also talked about the self. So how, um, the importance of a free self, of a self-determined self. And we today are such a selfish society um, because we've taken it a little bit too far. So mm. for them, it was this thrilling power of self-determination which now has become selfishness. So I wanted to find out what went wrong and where this all comes from. Okay, okay. Your books are um, intersected by the figure of another absolutely fascinating character who influenced, influenced the lives of all the protagonists. It's Get. Uh, having read his letters and studied his life, what are your thoughts on Get it today? And what do we owe to Goethe? So Goethe was Germany's most famous poet, still is Germany's most famous poet. He was a, he was a little bit older than the rest of the group. So he was, a, he was like a stern godfather to this group. And he was incredibly influential on Alexander von Humboldt, for example. So when Humboldt arrived in Jena in 1794, he was very much a child of the Enlightenment. He believed in rational thought, observations, experiments. 
And he met Goethe, who was a poet, but also a scientist. And Goethe, as Humboldt said himself, said himself, Goethe gave Humboldt new organs through which to see the world. Organs that were much more subjective. So it is with these new organs that Humboldt travels to South America. So it is with, with almost with Goethe's eyes, with the eyes of a poet, that he sees nature, not just the eyes of a scientist. Is there any character that you have discovered in your research that you have yet to write about or would like to write uh, more about? Maybe that the, 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 new, the, the, new, new the, the new one kind of popped up in the research. So I'm, okay. I, it, so far, always someone popped up from the research, but I, I'm terrible in finding new back book ideas. So it, um, it always takes me a long, long time. <laughs> okay, okay. We could say that today you are also a science communicator. And I try. <laughs> okay, obviously you are. Uh, in the midst of the, this strange context uh, of misinformation, anti-vaccination, and climate change, uh, denialist, what is the value of doing this work? Well, I think we histo historians are finders of truth. I think that's what we try to do. We try to find some truth in the past in order to shed some light on today. So I think it is, for me, it is very important um, because I don't think that history is a pile of dusty old ideas. I think history is something that really opens a window into the present. So I, I hope that what we historians are doing is also important um, because it is, it is the stories that sometimes give us some inspiration. So I've, you know, I, I, after my talks, I talk a lot to um, young environmentalists who feel very inspired when they hear the story of Alexander von Humboldt, someone who's been dead for 200 years almost, but someone who really believed in the same things they are believing and someone who talked about harmful human-induced climate change, someone who warned about the devastating effects of monoculture, deforestation and irrigation. So all subjects that they are dealing with today. So it is sometimes, I think, important to bring alive these forgotten figures from the past to give some inspiration for, for today or for the future. Okay, and the last one. Uh, the history of science has been constructed mainly from a European and Anglo-Saxon point of view. How can we remedy this excess of uh, European centered view? Well, I think um, you're very, you're absolutely right. And it's quite interesting to see how Humboldt, for example, he, went, he did a big detour from Cartagena when he was going down to Lima. I mean, he could have just taken a boat to come to Bogota to meet Mutis uh, because Mutis was the expert on South American flora. So Humboldt was very aware that he needed him. Humboldt was also very aware of the importance of indigenous, indigenous knowledge. So he, um, as he traveled through South America, he talked to indigenous people. He said that they are the best observers of nature, the best geographers of nature. So I think there is a, there's a, a whole other history to be written to kind of try to find it you know, from their perspective. Because I think Humboldt's idea that nature was a living organism is partly influenced from his time in Jena, because they were talking about this, but also from indigenous knowledge, which obviously believes that there's a mother earth and that earth is alive. Obviously. And the last one, this. <laughs> what is Andrea Wolf reading now? What am I reading now? Yes. I am reading so many novels. I can't believe how many novels I'm because I've judged in. Um, I was just a judge of the Bailey Gifford Nonfiction Prize mm, in England, yes. which is the most important nonfiction prize, and um, we had to read about a hundred nonfiction books, which were brilliant. <laughs> but at the moment, I'm reading lots of novels. I've just read um, Maggie O'Farrell's *The uh, Marriage Portrait*. It's called, mm. and I've just finished Hernan Diaz's um, *Trust*. So I am I'm reading novels at the moment. Thank you. Andrea, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for having me.